Before we move on to the lecture topic today, which is really the city in the eastern Mediterranean, the city in the Aegean world, um, I, I want to go back and compare Egypt and Mesopotamia because we sort of ran over that very quickly. In, last, in the last lecture's um, PowerPoint notes, you will see images of two places. One is Hattusas, which was the headquarters of the Hittite Empire in central Turkey, a very powerful Indo-European-speaking people who apparently migrated into that area, displacing the existing indigenous population. They, had, they were great traders and exerted tremendous influence to the south. Um, they traded a lot with Egypt, and actually we know from uh, hieroglyphic records in Egypt that they provided at least one Egyptian queen. Um, and they appear um, in the Bible as well. Um, the second is Mohenjo-Daro. Mohenjo-Daro was an Indus Valley civilization, very old, going back 3000 uh, BC, and it um, disappeared. And we're not sure why it disappeared. There were two cities associated with it that have been excavated. Uh, this is known as the Harappan civilization. Um, and they were apparently related to the sort of Indo-European groups. And we say that because they use orthogonal geometries and there are certain indications that some of the cultural affinities were similar to some of the things that we see later in Iran and other places that were Indo-European speaking. Um, but these people disappeared. And who they were and what they were, we don't know. So the two cities were Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. Morris talks about this in his book. Um, but we are going to omit those from the lectures, even though they're in the PowerPoints, uh, simply because we are trying to compress time. I do th want to compare Egypt and Mesopotamia, however, because I think it, it forms um, these, this sort of polar opposites of, of, of a dendritic pattern in the case of Mesopotamian cities, as we saw at Assur and Ur, and the orthogonal geometries of large areas that are planned as a unit that we see in Egypt. And I want to draw um, a very important comparison between those two. This is uh, Uruk, the sister city of uh, Mesopotamian city, sister city of Ur. And we see at the core of this, it was in fact a temple complex, probably associated with a very powerful ruler. And then uh, it gets rather vague as this artist's reconstruction moves out from that monumental core. But it was probably very much like Assur, which we would see here in this dendritic patch, uh, pattern of sort of dead-end streets that are, that are really tertiary streets operating off of secondary streets, which are operating off of primary streets in this kind of dendritic pattern. And it's probable that in these places what you had was a large extended family it's around the red area that you see here in which there are various entrances that are possible to recreate in this German archaeological map from the early part of the 20th century. In contrast, Egypt used orthogonal geometry and their cities uh, show all the hallmarks of being planned as an entire unit. Uh, we know a lot about Egypt and their monumental complex, surprisingly, uh, monumental architectural complexes, we know surprisingly little about their cities. Uh, the cities either disappeared, they were built on top of, they were flooded, uh, they were swept away. There are a few. Cahun is one. But the one that has drawn the most attention is Tel El um, Amarna. Now, Amarna may or may not be typical uh, of uh, all of these Egyptian cities that date back uh, into the second millennium um, BC. But uh, I say they may not because it was built by a, a peculiar pharaoh who for a very brief period um, sort of elevated Atun Ra as the one god from whom all others. So he was a monotheist, which is very different from all that came before him and what came became immediately after. Um, so there are some questions then, well, if he was peculiar enough to do that, then is it possible that he was peculiar enough to actually uh, have created very different kinds of cities? And the answer is we don't know. 
uh, because there just isn't enough evidence to draw to be conclusive um, um, o overall, at least none that I am aware of. This was um, a royal compound that was built by um, by um, Akhenaten, and um, it's built in several pieces. Now, what's interesting about this, I think this is typical of Egypt because they were in this, uh, unlike the braided rivers that we see in Mesopotamia, uh, the Nile is in a very narrow channel until it gets to um, the Mediterranean where it fans out into a delta, a regular delta. But it is, it has a very regular floodplain and it floods to that area and where, I mean, you can almost stand on a line where there is green and there is desert. And, and that was the entire lifeblood of Egyptian civilization. They didn't have too many enemies because they were protected by substantial desert on both sides. So these cities typically did not have defensive walls. And they were strung out um, along the river, up and down the river, because the river was the primary, um, not only the lifeblood, but the means of communication and transportation as well, as it still is in many respects. And uh, what we have then are a series of these that seem to be, at first glance, uh, disconnected from, you know, one from the other. What we're really looking at here are unexcavated areas with a royal road that is paralleling, in fact, um, the, um, the river. And uh, there's a slight rise in the ground, and typically uh, Egyptian cities, Egyptian architecture in general would be built on this slight rise right not on the arable land, but just outside the arable land. What we have then is a temple complex to Aten Ra, the great sun god, Ra or Re, and um, a series of um, royal buildings or buildings that were associated with the pharaoh. Uh, military headquarters, here is the pharaoh's house. Here we have a sanctuary, storehouse in the service of the Aten. This is where the relics of the god were kept and so forth, that kind of thing and then storehouses here, and then this large temple that we have here uh, to Aten Ra, which is always in this kind of this procession along a central uh, axis. As we move down the river, or in this case up the river because the Nile flows north, um, we see these um, residential complexes that we see here, often referred to as Complex B. The assumption is that these were uh, satellite towns or the part of the working, the working part of the town that was associated with the activities of the pharaoh. Now, when we sort of um, begin to examine bits and pieces of these, though, what we see is something quite different from what we see in Mesopotamia, and that is regularized units uh, that are a, clearly a subdivision of an overall scheme, an overall plan. Whenever you see this kind of regularity, what it means is that you are looking at something which is planned as a unit. Now, A.E.J. Morris and many other authors will use the term organic to describe this kind of dendritic pattern that we see at Ur and Assur and other places. This is a term I reject. I do not believe that cities are, in fact, um, bacterium. I don't think they grow in a Petri dish. I don't think they are, you know, scattered seeds that just somehow take root. They are planned, uh, but they may be planned on the margins by a process of accretion. Someone is adding to something marginally without an overall plan, all right? And so it takes on this pattern which doesn't uh, conform to any sort of known geometries such as this, and therefore Many authors will use the term organic. I believe it is an incorrect term. Nonetheless, uh, it's a textbook for this course. When I say an organic pattern, that's what I mean, okay? It doesn't mean that it's actually growing like my dog or something, okay? Um, weeds in the yard kind of thing, you know? Um, the difference, of course, is that this is a signal that we have a very high degree of uh, social and political organization that um, the, the, the laying out of a city, the laying out of a town was a serious enterprise that was done uh, in a hierarchical way with an intent, right? Now, this is very old, really old, and it's really difficult to know 
what exactly the intent was, and archaeologists, people who study these things, you know, there are whole conferences where they get together and this side of the room debates that side of the room of what all of this really was. Nonetheless, I wanted to point this out because it is in stark contrast to what we see in Mesopotamia, right? Stark contrast. Mahenjo-daro does, in fact, uh, exhibit some of the similar qualities, but in the case of Mahenjo-daro, we don't have writing, we don't have other things, so we don't know, all right? If we look at Cahun, which is another um, Egyptian town, we see a similar thing. So this begins to suggest, in fact, that we have some similarities that Akhenaten uh, was not perhaps uh, completely outside the mainstream of practice in terms of laying out cities as he was with the religion. But clearly what we have here is something which is planned in, um, as an overall, as an overall uh, idea of a city. The very thick wall that we see here, orthogonal geometries, is what is probably a market area that we see in this settlement of Cahun. Now, <coughs> all of the flow of the Nile moving north is moving into uh, the Mediterranean here and up these inland trade routes into the Hittite world which is to the north. You see Chatal Huyuk. Uh, see if I can identify this for you uh, right here. Chatal Huyuk. And then there we see Hattusis. This is the headquarters of the Hittite world. And um, there's also a sort of migration, uh, very old, of these Indo-European speaking people who come down into what is modern Iran. Um, it's actually where the word Aryan comes from, by the way, and Hitler had it all backwards. He didn't understand what he was doing. The, um, if we were in this area that we see right here, this is about where Gobekli Tepe is, and this is, of course, Jericho that we see right here. So this is a very, very old part of the world. This is the oldest. I mean, this has been settled for a long time, and cities uh, began to emerge both here. Here is Lagash, Larsa, Uruk. Ur is right there, Eridu, and then we see movement up the Tigris in the Euphrates Valley, and then we see it coming down along the Levant or the eastern Mediterranean coast. Uh, this is where the Phoenicians lived who gave us the alphabet, and um, there's a tremendous amount of trade there. Now, uh, let me go back. That was a slip. As I mentioned in the last lecture, um, travel by rivers, travel by water, uh, is in fact a whole lot easier than it is moving across the desert. And uh, so the eastern end of the Mediterranean becomes this sort of medium of exchange. Uh, today we tend to think of the northern Mediterranean as being European and Christian and the southern end of the Mediterranean being Muslim and North African, and that is true. But that is uh, fairly late. That occurs in the Middle Ages. And all through the ancient world, the Mediterranean was sort of the glue that bound the north and the south ends of this great inland sea together, sort of like sitting around a table. Um, it was sort of the medium through which exchange occurred. Um, there are two islands that were critical in this. Uh, one is Cyprus and the other is Crete. Uh, Cyprus is now sort of split, I believe, Alpita, is this correct, between um, Turkey and Greece. Greece, no, it's just a separate country, separate country today? Okay. Um, and, and Crete is part of Greece. But the people who lived on Crete in 2000 uh, BCE were not, in fact, Greek, although the people who excavated it, the British, at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, Sir Arthur Evans, when he's digging in here, he believes he's digging in the Greek world. So guess when he restores something, guess what he restores it as? his prior belief that he was actually in the Greek world. What we now know, in fact, is that these were not Greek. They did not speak Greek. They spoke uh, neither an Indo-European language nor a Semitic language. In fact, we don't really know who they are. Interestingly enough, the Palestinians believe that they are descended from the Minoans. Uh, and there may be some evidence to that because there was a great cataclysm, perhaps more than one, that occurred on uh, the island of Crete very long time ago, uh, that was uh, really signaled the end of it. It made it all the way back to the eighth row. Um, 
as a racer for something popped and went flying through the air. Thought actually he was shooting it at Aaron for a minute there. Um, the, um, there were these two great cataclysmic events that eventually caused uh, Crete to come under uh, the control of a group of people from the Greek Peloponnesus, the Peloponnesian Peninsula uh, in the Bronze Age, and um, they spoke a different language, a kind of proto-Greek um, than what we have today. So when we look then at this, um, at this area of the eastern Mediterranean, we have these ancient civilizations feeding out in this direction, coming down along the southern coast of what is now Turkey, all along these inland trade routes through the Kidron Valley that we see right up here through the Jordan Rift, and then on up there is actually the Euphrates that we see right there. So there's a tremendous amount of exchange occurring here. I want to focus on Crete, however, because they were great traders and because of their link, actually, to what emerges in, Bron in the Bronze Age um, in Crete. We're dealing here with a time of 2000 to 1200 um, BC. And um, one of the peculiar characteristics of the cities on Crete, they were great city builders, uh, is that there were no walls, no defensive walls. Uh, perhaps they were the sort of Switzerland of the ancient eastern end of the Mediterranean. Um, and these cities appear to have been, uh, to Kostov's point, that they never come as singularities, that you have a major sort of city and then territory around it with smaller settlements that seem to be attached to that and seem to be grouped, as we see here, um, in um, regions. And we can sort of map those, um, map those regions um, as we see here. Let me also point out, uh, I'm not going to ask you this on a test, but it's useful if you can sort of get some sense of the chronology simply because it helps you sort things out on other questions that might come up on a test or that might be useful to you at some point your lives. So these were uh, no defensive walls. They uh, appear to me, and this is pure speculation on my part, there's no evidence for this, that these may have been very elaborate trade associations um, with a sort of uh, king or a president or someone who actually uh, controlled a series of, of tr literally trade associations that um, had various territories that they farmed and so forth for subsistence, but that their primary income was really ocean-going uh, trade. Clearly, they were heavily influenced by Egyptian civilization. We just simply look at uh, Minoan art. They're called Minoan because there was a king named Minos, later appears in mythology, the Minotaur, his half-brother, and so on. Um, and we look at the pose here, and we look at the pose here, I mean, it's very clear that there is a relationship between this and this, culturally. We also see mixed ethnicities in both Egypt and in Crete. A very famous uh, little statue of the snake goddess, very old. And they, um, I love this, they, they practiced um, this peculiar sport of bull jumping. The bull would come charging, and you actually did a somersault over the top of the bull. Crazy, right? Uh, so the Spanish kind of got it right when they stepped to the side, right? <laughs> um, and uh, here we actually see the athlete moving over the top of the bull, turning the somersault and so forth. Uh, the writing, as I mentioned, um, is really of two types that have been discovered there. The language that the Minoans spoke which was uh, associated with Linear A. It is a language that has never been deciphered. It was replaced sometime in the 12th century before uh, the Common Era um, by Linear B, which is a kind of Proto-Greek. In both cases, these symbols are taken probably from the Phoenician. Certainly, Linear B is taken from um, Alpha, Beta, is taken from the Phoenician, um, the Phoenician um, syllabary. So um, Linear B was actually deciphered by a young architect named Michael Ventris, who was a Brit who um, had attended a lecture 
um, sometime right after the First World War, and he became fascinated with, uh, with this, and he worked on it for a very long period of time until he was able uh, to decipher it. This comes from the very famous um, disk of Phaistos that we see here, which has linear uh, sort of hieroglyphs on one side and then um, um, linear B on the other. You can read the text when you download the lecture. Now, there are cities in some, I'm not sure I would, that I'm convinced these were cities in the, in the de, by the definition that I'm using in here, but we'll call them that. I think we do see some, some Egyptian influence here. And what we're looking at, actually, though, the reason I say they may not be cities is that what we're looking at is really a royal compound around a public court. And it's possible that this was used for all the sort of public activities, including bull jumping, um, you know, if someone committed a crime, we could imagine they're judged in public here, that the political life of this place unfolded in public. And then around it, um, what we see actually, of course, are storehouses, warehouses, places for the military officers um, and others, uh, along with um, houses and so forth as they spill down, uh, spill down the hill. But the core of this, the center of this, is this royal compound, this royal palace that we see here opening out onto a public court. This is not something that we see uh, opening out like that in Mesopotamia or in any place else. This seems to be their unique contribution. These were very, very small. This is Malia, the part that has been excavated. There is that courtyard uh, that we referred to. That we referred to here is a reconstruction of it, uh, an archaeological drawing in which we see these storehouses and things that are associated with the royal activities here, almost as if it was like a monastic compound in the Middle Ages. I mean, it's really remarkable um, how tightly packed and how small these areas actually were. This is at Phaistos, where the disk of Phaistos was discovered. And there we see the paved court here, uh, again, opening out with this corridor back into uh, this outdoor room, which was probably the throne room that you see up here as 7-4, number 7-4 or 74 that you see here on the, um, if I can get the cursor to come up that you see right here around this peristyled um, courtyard. And you see this monumental set of steps that comes up here into this hypostyle hall, um, which then had a very narrow passage. So most likely this was for meetings and other kinds of things. But it appears to me that all of this is actually associated with the activities of the royal court or the, the leader, the ruler. Okay. This is an artist's reconstruction of the palace at Knossos from the southwest, uh, Knossos being the largest of these, um, of these cities. And we don't really know that much what they look like, but this is a reasonable reconstruction, I think. Quite sophisticated with plumbing systems, drainage systems, indoor plumbing, pipes, terracotta water pipes that are brought in. And then here we see one of those paved courts with the monumental stairs coming down. And we can imagine their religion, festivities, holidays, holy days, and so forth uh, would occur around this court. Now, this is where it begins to go wrong. And that is that at Knossos, uh, Arthur Evans uh, reconstructed this. And what we have are, is Greek, sort of Greek um, ornamentation that we see here. And that is uh, now believed to be incorrect. The um, inverted columns uh, clearly owe more to Egypt than to anywhere else. And there we see then how it is possible, in fact, to reconstruct um, this from the archaeological remains. This caused a great stir in the late 19th century when it was discovered. Unfortunately, when uh, scientific archaeology was in its infancy in the latter uh, quarter, really, of the 19th century, so much was destroyed in the process or restored incorrectly that um, it, it is impossible today to recover uh, what was originally there. Um, this is the throne room of the palace at Knossos, and uh, I think this decoration actually is authentic. There was enough there. To, um, uh, to actually uh, reconstruct these murals that we see on the wall, these fresco paintings, pigment into wet plaster. 
And here we see the ruler and then his council sitting around it on uh, around him on either side. Now, for reasons that are complex and controversial, as anything this old is, um, there, the Minoan civilization came to an end, and it was at least one cataclysmic event, probably two, possibly three. Uh, the most likely was an enormous tsunami, an enormous tidal wave that resulted from the eruption of, um, of, um, of a huge volcano here uh, on what is now the island of Santorini, a very beautiful place. Uh, a lot of people go there on their honeymoon, <laughs> um, climb the mountain and watch the sunset. But um, it, what they don't realize is that they're actually on the rim of a, vol of a huge volcano. And that if you sort of look at it in detail, you can see this enormous cone erupted. Um, it probably put a wall. There is, in fact, some evidence that it put a wall of water 40 to 50 feet high, came and simply destroyed um, all of the coastal cities, um, um, including Gnosis. Uh, it is also, there is some evidence, by the way, that the Black Sea was originally not connected to the Mediterranean. Uh, that it was much lower than it is today, that it was fresh, not salt, because there are remains of human settlements found below the present water level. And it's believed that, in fact, when this volcano erupted, the earthquake broke open uh, the channel at the Bosporus up, up in here and connected the Black Sea that we see here into uh, the Aegean uh, that we see here, into the Mediterranean. So let's assume that our volcano erupts, and that is certainly going to cause a, a major, major sort of black swan event, a major cataclysmic event, which uh, may have been the end of Minoan civilization. In any case, it weakened them. Um, there is also, of course, from literature, which begins to appear about this time. We have writing, but we really don't have much literature. We have the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which is actually... Um, a very, very, very old text, but Homer is one of the oldest that we have, actually. And, of course, it's a chronicle in the Iliad of the war between um, the Mycenaean Greeks, uh, Bronze Age Greeks, um, and Troy, um, a city in Ionia, in Turkey. And, um, and then here we see Hattusas have located here, and then here is Knossos that we see here. Around the 13th century before the Common Era, around 1200 to 1100, the Trojan War supposedly occurred around 11 to 1127, somewhere in there. There uh, were a series of disruptive events that occurred. The volcanic eruption occurred much earlier. Uh, here, I put this in here so that you can actually uh, sort of look at the timeline, trying to keep it straight, so you probably want to print that out and look at it. Uh, but in any event, um, what is clear, we know from Linear B, from the Linear B writing discovered here, that in this weakened condition, the people who lived here came down and took over. Now, when they took over, did these people leave and go here? Did they leave and go here? What happened to them? Or were they simply absorbed? Or, as in the case of late Roman England, were they invited in to protect against the Irish and the Scots and the Vikings and the others that were coming in? The Anglo-Saxons were invited in to help defend. And they said, hmm, we like it. We'll stay. We'll take over. Right? Um, we don't know the answer to that. And again, this is subject of great debate, and it is not the intent of this course to sort of try to unpack that. I am incapable of unpacking that. So what we do know is that uh, the Minoan civilization became, in a sense, the foundation for uh, these people from the north who came down and took over. Uh, they were Bronze Age, Greek-speaking, not the Greeks that built the Parthenon, not the classical Hellenic period, um, but what is called the Hellatic period. It's Bronze Age, very early. And if we compare this reconstruction here at Mycenae to this that we see here at Knossos, uh, we notice that they are remarkably similar 
Um, well, who were these people? Uh, they did not call themselves Mycenaeans. That's what we call them. They called themselves Atriids. And as I mentioned, um, Mycenae was, was excavated by Heinrich Schliemann, who also excavated Troy in the 1870s. And let me comment as a sidebar here. Schliemann, um, on the, if, we, if we weighed Schliemann's career like this, we would say, well, on the positive end, he um, believed that the Homeric epics might, in fact, be true, that they might actually have a basis in truth. These wars really did exist. I'm going to find these cities. He was crazy, right? So he went out, and he organized himself, and he started digging at Troy. And uh, what he didn't know was that he had dug through uh, the city that he was looking for and had already destroyed it by the time it was, he realized there's actually an architect named Dorpfeld who joined him and said, wait a minute, you know, if you look at this construction technique and this construction technique and we connect this to this and that to that, you can see you've already breached through uh, the Bronze Age city that you were looking for and you're actually at a lower level, right, at the earlier settlement. So we have to weigh Schliemann's contributions. When you see drawings of, of and, and very early daguerreotype photographs of, of these excavations, including the one at Mycenae, they are out there with mules and carts and shovels and pickaxes. Now, I don't know how many of you have been on a, mar a modern archaeological site, but they are down there with microscopes and camel hair brushes, okay, very carefully recording every little thing. These guys are out there with pickaxes and carts, and they're shoveling stuff into the carts. It's almost like they were vandals, right? So a whole lot was destroyed uh, in the process. Now, he believed that uh, he had actually discovered in a tomb, a very famous tomb, the uh, grave of Agamemnon, and that this was his desk mask. Well, it wasn't. It was much older than that. Um, but um, nonetheless, uh, these are some of the things that, that, um, that Schliemann pulled out of the site uh, at Mycenae. Fortunately, uh, it was pretty substantial, um, and as a result, we have, um, we have at least the walls and the, and the outline of the, pretty much the entire city. Uh, it's still there. Uh, some of you have been there. Let me see the hands of the alumni. You've been there, right? It's pretty impressive, isn't it? And um, so what are we looking at here? Now, remember, these are the people who took, took over Crete. Um, the first is, you see one, two, three, four, and five. Um, one is actually the gate into um, uh, what is essentially the upper city. So you, again, you think of this as an onion. At the very core is the royal compound here and the temple here. That is walled. See that? And there's a kind of waiting area or forecourt here before you pass into the gate into this house type, which is called a megaron. Megaron. Um, well, that road that you see there actually comes in through another gate that we see here. This was not the wall of the city. This was a kind of secondary wall, protective defensive wall, and then outside of that was the working part of the town, down the slope, down here where five is that we see here. So one is the very famous uh, Lion's Gate, one of the oldest bas-reliefs, uh, one of the oldest. And then here, Grave Circle A. Um, again, Schliemann did not know this, so he believed that he was actually excavating uh, the, the families, uh, you know, ancestors of Agamemnon, perhaps he was. But there was a prohibition against burial inside the wall of the town. So one of two things is possible here. One is, is that um, the town grew, and as it grew, it incorporated Grave Circle A, or it was a heroine, meaning that it was actually associated with uh, the founders of the town, right? Founders could be buried inside the walls of the city. Most likely, this wall that we see here 
is coming after the initial settlement here, and this is actually the burial ground of the people who built this. The people who lived here were buried way away, down the road onto a hillside in these very famous uh, Tholos tombs. So if we look at this, then we see it sort of in plan. Of critical importance is this that we see here. This is the cistern. It is the water supply at the postern gate where in time of attack or in time of need, you are able to get access to a protected water source, a cistern underground. We see this in Jerusalem uh, with Hezekiah's tunnel, uh, the Gihon Spring. We know from the biblical sources that David attacks the Jebusite city of Jerusalem. How? By entering through the water tunnel. He finds the external source, and he's able to get into the city at night by sneaking through the water pipes, right? Um, similar kind of thing that we see here in the citadel um, of Mycenae. This is what it looks like. It's not much above, you know, three feet remaining. But as I said, uh, fortunately, the walls, these called Cyclopean walls in many cases, because they couldn't imagine anybody could move, had to be giants because they couldn't move stones that big. Uh, up to the very top, which was, of course, the palace and the temple uh, complex. There's a view of it uh, from the outer city that we see here with workshops and houses, and then moving into this royal compound. compound. Here we see those cyclopean walls the size of these great stones coming in through the very famous Lion's Gate. Now we see a detail of it. The lintel, or not the lintel, the threshold, by the way, still contains grooves where the a chariot, a royal chariot, could be driven across the threshold inside um, the royal city, the citadel. That's the area from the rear. Uh, that gate is right there, and as we move in here into Grave Circle A, we see these shafts that were put down. These are very old. And most likely, they predated the construction of um, the expansion of the wall beyond uh, that that was um, associated with the original town. There's a view of it. It's quite impressive. And a detail of it. There's the outer enclosure. And then here we are moving up uh, the Royal Road up into that sort of staging area before we enter the Megaron, which is here, and the throne room, which was here, overlooking the Argolid. And then here we see from the postern gate, this is the entrance into the cistern or the water supply. Now, I will probably say this several times, but it is very important, and I'll begin by saying it now. If you do not have clean water in and dirty water out, you do not have civilization. That is absolutely true. You have to figure out ways of getting fresh water, clean water, potable water into your city, and you have to get your waste product out. That was true in 1200 BCE, and it is true today. And um, it will be a sort of recurring theme as we move through the semester. From the uh, citadel, looking then down at the part of the ecos, or the houses, the domestic part, where houses and workshops, including the very famous house of the painted vase, uh, were these, that's where it was discovered. And then the view down from uh, the lower part that we see, this was all occupied now. All of this was this town that was... Um, the outlying portion, there's the sort of cyclopean enclosing wall, and here is the royal compound that we see up on the very top. Well, down, um, down the road behind uh, this photograph, behind, if you were taking that photograph to your rear, uh, were these very famous Tholos tombs, which uh, yielded a great amount of material for Schliemann. And uh, architecturally, they are fascinating. They're not sort of true domes. The dome shape is created uh, because of corbelling of stones, the laying of one stone on top of another in a corbel pattern. Uh, and then they are covered 
with a mound of earth. This appears in a lot of um, Indo-European type burials. We see this in, uh, in a number of places. The um, very impressive, though, look at the chamfered uh, stone that we see down here. There's very elaborate door posts that are um, now missing. The, the, the term tholos is the shape of the building. It means round. And um, these, this is called the treasury of the Atreids because um, this was the tomb of the royal family of the house of, uh, presumably the house of Agamemnon. On the other side of the city then, down in the cistern, you see these steps cut down through the rock to get down to a water supply that is protected in time of attack. Like uh, we saw on, and to Kostov's point, and like we saw on, on Crete, uh, Mycenae was the larger city of a series of cities, each one with a presumed king, at least if Homer is to be believed. And um, they were in league with one another uh, when they felt a common threat. Um, a number of these you see here at Mycenae on the high point, Tiryns, which is a few miles to the south uh, of Mycenae, with its 20-foot uh, thick walls. And then here is the agricultural territory that was controlled uh, by the, the, the town, controlled by the city. Well, I mentioned that there were a series of cataclysmic events, a series. Uh, certainly with Crete, it is probable that the eruption of the volcano at Thera, um, Santorini, um, actually caused the, the weakened condition to the point where they were vulnerable and the Mycenaeans simply came in. Either they were invited in or they came in and took over. In any event, the, uh, linear A is displaced by linear B. Um, but from the Egyptian, some of the Egyptian inscriptions here, we know of a mysterious group of people that were referred to in the ancient text simply as the Sea Peoples. We don't know who they were. We don't know where they came from. But for at least 100 years, if the texts here are accurate, uh, they were essentially pirates that moved around in the eastern Mediterranean, and they attacked people. And um, whether the Sea People were at some point maybe associated with Mycenaeans, we don't think so because it appears from some texts at Mycenae that they were attacked by the Sea Peoples. You wouldn't attack yourself. Um, but we don't know. There's one theory uh, that um, actually has some credibility that they came from Sardinia. Sardinia, to the western Mediterranean. We don't know. But in any event, whoever they were, they attacked Egypt and were defeated. I think Ramses, at one point Ramses, uh, whichever it was, one of them, um, anyway, it was a great victory. That's what you're looking at here. So it's 1178, and, um, and it was recorded pretty far up the Nile, you know, down on the map, um, because it was recorded at Luxor. So um, the Sea Peoples attacked. They attacked the Peloponnesian Peninsula. They attacked... Uh, uh, Crete, we can assume that they attacked uh, the, uh, the um, Turkey, what's now Turkey, as well as the Levant, and um, then they disappear. They disappear from history. We don't know who they were. We don't know where they came from. We don't know anything about them, but we just know that they existed and that they were constantly referred to. It's interesting that all the ancient texts simply referred to them in this anonymous way, these people of the sea. Right? They didn't say the Hittites. They didn't say the Hebrews. They didn't say the, you know, they said the, the people of the sea. Then there was an event that appears to have come from the north, which is referred to as the Dorian invasion. And this is occurring around 1100 uh, years uh, before the Common Era. Uh, at the end of the Trojan War. And it appears that these people came in and took over this Bronze Age civilization at Mycenae, 
Troy and other places. Uh, writing goes into decline. It's referred to often as the Dark Age because there, there's a decline in art, there's a decline in writing, a decline in all kinds of things. So there's a lot of turbulence that's occurring around this time in the um, eastern end of the Mediterranean. And there is some evidence, in fact, of, uh, in a very short period of time, um, carbon layers that would indicate fire uh, have been uncovered at every site that you see here, all within, datable to within about 100 years of one another. There's also some texts here um, which indicate that these were people coming from the north somewhere, um, somewhere in Thrace, perhaps, somewhere in Macedonia, perhaps, somewhere perhaps further north, Bulgaria, who knows. Um, but you can see here translated, the enemy grabbed all the priests from everywhere and without reason murdered them secretly by simple drowning. I'm calling out to my descendants for the sake of history. I'm told that the northern strangers continued their terrible attack, terrorizing and plundering until a short time ago. That is Michael Ventris translating, interestingly enough, Linear B. And then Michael Woods, um, you can read this later, but uh, this is sort of uh, an enrollment in an attempt actually to fend off um, the, uh, apparently the Sea People, not the Dorian invader, invaders, but the Sea Peoples. So whether these were coordinated attacks or not, there is an exogenous element that enters into the eastern uh, end of the Mediterranean and takes over. And with that, the civilization, particularly in the Aegean world, goes into a sharp decline. And it will not reemerge from this shroud of the Dark Age again until about the 8th century BCE, when we begin to get the emergence of writing, substantial writing, we begin to get the emergence of what we know of as the classical Greek city. So that's where we are heading next. Are there any questions about any of this? Is that reasonably clear? Okay. Two things to remember here. What? Mesopotamian cities had what kind of structure? Dendritic. And Egyptian cities had what kind of structure? Orthogonal blocks, correct. It's the most important thing. 